He is the author of the memoir, Praise of Motherhood. He is the co-founder of LitReactor.com, founder of Perfect Edge Books, and he's working unironically on his PhD about the figure of Jesus Christ and novels in several European and American authors. He publishes nonfiction articles in various print and online publications across the USA, even though until this week he had never been further west of Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, give a very American welcome to Mr. Phil Jordan. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm very happy to be the token European here, because it means I can get away with some faux pas, so you guys can just chalk up to me being European. Um, I don't have any uh, drinking games or anything, because unfortunately my book is kind of sad, and it's going to make me sad to read it. Uh, so, it's about the death of my mother in 2009. Um, she had a very sudden brain aneurysm and just dropped dead on the spot. Now, because I was uh, a young guy and I was not in the same country, it was kind of traumatizing as it always is. Nobody likes losing a parent. And I figured that I'd try to encapsulate some of the horror of losing somebody you love that much in a book. Because when people often write memoirs, they're writing about themselves. I tried about myself with my mom in the picture. And so... Being in Kansas City is in, in increasingly important, I've noticed, since I've remembered that when I was a kid, about 10, I wanted to be a truck driver. That was my ambition. And my mother said, you'll never be a truck driver in Portugal. It's too small. You should go to the, the Midwest. Well, I'm not, I'm not even able to ride a bicycle. If there's any bullies in the audience, please put me on a bicycle and watch me cry. It's funny. Okay. <laughs> But, uh, but I am able to feel that this is worth it. I love Kansas City. I love the fact that you guys are not what, you know, what any other crowd I've ever been around has been. You guys are actually nice, so thank you. Um, and I'm only going to read about a few pages from the opening of my book. It's called Praise of Motherhood, as, as Brandon said. All right. Let me begin. It was Veterans Day. The Pope spoke into a microphone so the thousands around him could hear his weary voice. And in the airport lounge, my sister and I waited for our flight to take off, trying not to listen to the televised broadcast of the Pope's solemn speech. I held my sister's hand and heard her say fuck for the first time. Fuck. You think she's going to be okay? And I said, I don't know. And she said, why aren't they telling us what's going on? I don't know. I don't want mom to die. I know. I'm so scared. I know. And the Pope went on. Speaking of the dead, the men whose uh, lives had been lost in a terrible war, and he praised them, their families, for the courage they'd shown. He spoke of Christ, but not much. Sometimes he closed his eyes and paused. From the airport lounge, sitting in front of the television screens, I had to rely on the cameras for a sense of what, was, what being there was like. Safe and comfortable and mourning out of patriotic or humanistic duty in a spirit of contemplation. The Pope did not know that my mother was dying in a little hospital in Portugal. Neither did the lady who announced on the intercom at the airport that out of respect for the men who had lost their lives during the war, however many decades ago, we were all invited to stand up for two minutes of silence, and everyone else in the lounge stood up. My sister and I remained in our seats, and we hugged each other. As far as I knew, my mother was dying or dead. A small, tanned Portuguese woman with curly, dark hair and two dogs, two kids, a lovely, loving, wonderful lady, all of that sob story stuff. It turned out that when we were waiting for our flight, she was still alive. She would only die in the evening. After the Pope was done speaking, and everyone was having dinner and no longer thinking about the veterans, but nobody had warned me. Nobody had warned anybody. Everyone was on the way to Portugal, my uncle, my grandfather, me, my sister, all of us trying to protect someone. They didn't tell me what had happened until I arrived in Portugal. 
I didn't tell my sister everything I knew, which was next to nothing, because I wanted to think I could protect her. I spoke to my father on the phone, and he was in tears. I'll be there when you land, he said. And I said, but why? What's going on? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure, but if I were you, I'd... Oh, Jesus. If I were you, I'd brace myself for the worst. And he broke into tears and hung up. They'd been separated 15 years. On the plane, my sister and I spoke little. I told her it'd be okay. I told her even if the worst happened, I'd be around for her. You're my little sister. Tell me about Denver, how her class is going. And she gave short, bored answers and asked me about my life. I told her I'd been able to live well, to take the train to Paris from London with a friend when I found out something was wrong with our mom. But what's wrong with her, my sister said. I don't know. Why don't they just tell us? Because they're trying to save, save us, to keep us sane. How can I be sane when my mom is dying all of a sudden? I really don't know. When we arrived in Portugal and I saw my family standing together waiting for us, my grandparents, my father, my aunt, I knew there was no hope. My mother had been taken to the big nothing and that was it. And what could I do about anything except to write and doodle and try my damnedest to cry? Cry for God's sake. Cry, you ingrate. Can't you even shed one tear for your mommy? No, no crying, and that was a pretty recurrent problem for the next year or so. The lack of tears, the passionless way I dealt with everything. Cry. If you don't cry, you will never be taken seriously again. But by whom? Who cares if I cry? It won't change anything. And though I didn't cry, I kept a series of notes. Tiny memories it was important not to forget. Ever, ever. Things to stick into the book I had already decided to write about my mother. I spent the night at my mother's house. When I got there, Vlad asked me how she was. I told him she was dead. And the world inside him seemed to collapse all at once. His muscular body trembled. He could not believe it. Could not believe it. And he expressed himself in the best Portuguese he could. I could only understand half of what he was saying. Then he switched to Ukrainian and sobbed louder and hugged me and I was numb. The numbness lasted a year. You have lost the woman you wanted to marry, I wanted to say, and I have lost my mommy. We're probably losing the same thing. I phoned my grandmother's house and spoke to my sister to see if she was all right. You think you'll be okay tonight? And she said, yes. We'll see each other tomorrow? Yes. And there was much to say apart from good night. I love you. Things that were meaningless in the face of our non-mother. We hung up and I went into the kitchen to drink some water. Mother was dead, but there was still food in the fridge. What do you do with a, a dead woman's food? You don't eat it. That's like eating death. I gave it to the dogs. All of it went splat on the floor, and the dogs lapped it up. And that was the first night. She'd been dead three hours, and already, like the selfish boy I was and am, I started removing little pieces of her from her own house. Letting the dogs eat everything in the fridge ought to have made them ill, but they seemed fine. And anyway, who cares if the dogs die? My mother's dead, and they're her dogs. Let them die with her. Let the dogs go back to that infinity, like their precious mommy. I sat in that kitchen, marble tiles cold under my feet, open fridge humming, dogs slurping and chewing on everything from beans to raw beef to yogurt. And I felt a weird thickness in the brain that I think can only come when someone has died. You know the numbness? Your shoulders are tense and your head is heavy, and it feels natural. Loud thoughts about trivial things, a lot of pacing and clenched teeth, and the, the notion that you're teetering above some gaping abyss. It's a horrible thing to go through, but there you have it. I started thinking about nothing in particular, certainly not about my mother. And I don't care if it's a defense mechanism, a way of dealing with the immediate pain of loss, but not thinking about your mother when she's just kicked the bucket is a pretty terrible thing to do. And I imagine everyone goes through it, so I'm not alone. But I was alone that night. Me and the dogs, sitting around the kitchen table, imagining a life without our mom, without pancakes in the morning, without intelligent discussions about things my sister found boring, without anything for all I cared. The kitchen stank of food when I left it. I lay in bed for a while. That repulsive image of my mother lying there in the hospital, brain dead, breathing softly through tubes, Nothing inside her head now but death. The machines were keeping her alive. 
God, make those machines work a little harder. Don't just keep her alive for me to see this. I don't want to see this. Not the whistle like breathing through tubes. This is not my mother. Not as I want to remember her. If that's my mother, where's her smile? Huh? Tell me that. I don't say she'll always be in my heart because she won't. She won't be anywhere that matters after she dies. She'll be nowhere once she's not even here in the hospital bed. You show me where exactly my mother is in my heart. Which ventricle? How much blood does my mother require to linger in my heart? How much can I show off how beautiful and wonderful my mother is when she's hidden in a muscle somewhere in my ribs? Where's her substance? What can your poetry do to make her less absolutely, terrifyingly, impossibly, absurdly dead? I lay there and I thought of all this. I wondered what I would do, try to stop trying to make sense of the senseless. No good, of course, because we're terribly ambitious creatures. The time comes for new survival tactics. Oh, I'll build a fire every day in your honor, mother, and that will keep me warm, and it will provide me with a means to grill the deer that have hunted through the stupid thoughts like that. Everyone takes on a, a certain self-importance, you know, when you feel you've lost the biggest part of the world. You're forced to adjust your eyes and see the little things, feel your way through the impalpable black. I thought of the plane ride home while everything was uncertain. Before they told us what was going on, I'd held my sister's hand, looked out of the window, blank, blank, blank mind and a weird tenseness in my muscles. Let this be over soon. I don't care if she lives or dies, as long as I don't have to guess the truth. They hadn't said, your mother is dying. They'd said, get over here straight away and expect the worst. And that was when I realized that was, it was going to be bad. No simple operation, a major kind of thing. And quietly, on that plane journey, I resented each of them resented them for not having told me before that my mother had fainted and been taken to a hospital where her life could end at any second. I tried to call her on the phone the day before and she hadn't answered, so I tried again and no answer, and soon I began to think something was wrong. But what do you do when something's wrong in Portugal and you're in England and all you have is a telephone? You call someone else, someone close to her, and that was her boyfriend who spoke little Portuguese, no English, and in his rudimentary way he said he said my mother had an explosion in the brain and i said what do you mean explosion in the brain he said i don't know what's going on and i said where is she and he said the hospital and i said well who's with her he told me my grandmother was with her and nobody else was allowed to be in there heart pounding sweating all the symptoms i try to call my grandmother no answer so I called my grandfather and he said my mother's brain was being operated on right now. He was flying in some doctor from New York and he would keep me posted. And he hadn't wanted to worry me by telling me earlier and I wanted to say that it only worried me more, but what can you do? Everyone's a little different under dreadful circumstances. But yes, I was lying in bed thinking of all the things when my mother died. One image in particular, one strange and terrible image, lingered above all in my head. The tubes were awful, and the beeping of the machines and the brain-dead specimen on the bed. But the worst part was her nipple. When I arrived at the hospital, they led me into the room where my mother was taking her last breaths. They left me alone there with my sister and my father, who come from another town to support us, the children, and to see his ex-wife one last time. I looked at that thing on the bed like my mother, but no longer there, no longer interested in me or my sister or anything else, simply a woman-shaped thing with tubes sticking in and out of it in a little hospital gown that barely covered her. And I kissed her cheek without a tear, and as I did so, her arm fell from the bed and I saw my mother's nipple, the nipple from my infancy. So there it was. There it was. The nipple was her death. The instrument of my feeding was now the last sign of life within her. The breaths she took were artificial. Her eyes were closed. There were no thoughts inside that shell of a head. But the nipple, which I was never supposed to see again, was uncovered and she felt no shame, no discomfort, not even mild embarrassment. Because she was dead, my grandmother walked into the room and we had a short debate on whether to ask a priest to come in and perform the last rites. She wanted none of it. But I said, get the priest in here. 
Even if you don't believe in God, I don't care. You should thank him because my mother felt no pain, or so you say. Let's at least thank the God we don't believe in. Let him have his holy way with my mother's soul, yeah? And I went on like that for a while, not quite sure what I was saying. So the priest came and talked to my mother for a while, and she didn't answer. Soon we were gone in a daze, silent. My sister, in tears, went to my grandmother's house. When my father drove me home, he had cried on the phone. I'd never heard him cry. On the way over to my house, I told my father it was okay. My mother lived on through me, and I believed it, and he did too, but neither of us really believed it because she was kaput. She was nothing now. But still, we believed it. It was also the first time in years I told my father I loved him. He didn't say it back. But he looked at me and said it something like with his eyes, and that was enough for me. And he said, Yeah, you're right. we got to help each other. You and I have more in common than most fathers and sons. And I said, Yeah, you're right. We do. Drive me home, and I'll, I'll come visit you soon. Thank you. Come get your picture taken with me or something. It'll be on my Facebook page. Show support or something. Thank you.